I'm in a much more comfy spot for this one. I learned my lesson last time. <laughs> I honestly have to stand because if not, I feel like I'm like hunched over all the time. That's why I just I really like, just had to adjust myself. I felt like I was hunched over. <laughs> oh, stop it. Let's see. did this like the other night with Michael Sanford too. It was like, didn't say that we were live right away. And then it caught us just like chatting. <laughs> My thing says live on Facebook at the top. Yeah, mine does too, but I don't know. What's happening there? On your notifications? Yeah, that's what it says on mine, but it's not. Up at the top of yeah. my- Of the Zoom. Yeah. yeah it on my phone too probably oh there we go now we're live all right ladies hi welcome hi how are you i'm good all right hold on let me get now i can't see you we're here oh there you go all right so let's just um because on facebook they like kind of trickle in um so let's just kind of do like we can chat for a little bit and then we can um i don't know what do you, well, first of all, what are you guys doing during quarantine? Let's just talk about that. And then we'll introduce ourselves. Um, so let's just kind of chat for a little bit. Oh, there you are. All right. Um, spending a lot of time with my dog. Like I just showed everybody her. She's a little confused as to why we are home all the time. I was going to say, how many she's... walks a day have you gone on? Uh, too many. I think she's <laughs> over it at this point. I think she's like, okay, like that, get out of my house. So, yeah. you know, that's been pretty funny, but you know, just, I guess, trying to do as much as we can, like work-wise, trying to catch up on stuff and spending yeah. time together and, you know, just taking it day by day. Yeah. You, Laura? Yeah, pretty much the same. I mean, we're trying to get really creative with um, our social media and like interacting with the clients and giving them stuff to focus on during this time and to do um and you know a lot of the great thing is people are getting really creative and a lot of the casting directors are doing like you know virtual yeah, classes almost, virtual yeah. open calls virtual talks and so i do think it's yep. a good time um for all of that but in personally speaking you know a lot of live workouts and a lot of wine they've just been going hand in hand for me oh yeah i've definitely been working out at home and i've definitely been drinking too much wine the other day i was like <laughs> i was talking to my one of my girlfriends out here i was like i think i have to cut it off during the week or something because i just literally I i'm like is it five o'clock six o'clock like it doesn't matter <laughs> i'm like wondering like why why don't i have this amazing body because i've been working out so much more but i'm like oh it's because i've been drinking so much more wine yeah it's a balancing act you, you yeah. need to have balance in your life it can't be too much one or the other yeah, exactly. I know. Um, well, we got like 20 people on. So let's um, start with like some introductions. Let's start with you, Laura, um, who you are, a little bit of background, and then we'll go to you, Mallory. Cool. Yeah, um, I'm Laura Thede, and uh, I work in the LA office at DDO in the youth division, and I've been at DDO for seven years. It'll be seven years this fall. Um, before that, I was actually in casting. I worked for... Um, a commercial casting director, Terry Burland, um, and then Harriet Greenspan, who is a pretty well-known kids casting director. She does film and TV. Um, and yeah, now work at DDO in the LA office. Obviously, Mallory, with Mallory, we work, we do TV film, voiceover, commercials, everything. Mallory. Uh, my name is Mallory Levy. I work in the New York office, like Laura said. Um, we, I handle all the kids. So we work on everything from television, film, theater, commercial, a little bit of print, and we have a really great voiceover division. Um, I also started in casting as my first internship, um, and I worked at a casting agency interning right out of college. And then right after that, I started as an assistant um, at Innovative Artists, and I was there for two years, and I worked in the beauty division there. So I worked with models for commercials and celebrity endorsements. And then after that, um, I worked with kids for two years, another agency, back to models, and now back working with kids. Um, and I have to say my preference is definitely working with kids. And um, I've been at CDO for the past 
two years, a little over two years now. Nice. So yeah. let's piggyback on that. Um, some questions are populating right now, but, um, and so don't find me rude because I'm looking over at this other screen for my questions, I'm sorry. Um, but let's piggyback on that. Why do you like working with kids? Um, what is it about working with kids and parents, new or established? So um, I find that working with kids is something I prefer mostly because it, you know, kids who are interested in the industry comes from a really genuine place. You know, I always say like, they don't have to pay rent tomorrow. So when they're doing this, it's because they love it. And it's because they genuinely enjoy um, being in this world. And I think that that makes a really huge difference when it comes to working with actors. And I think sometimes you know, adults get to the point where they're a bit jaded and it's like they have to do this because they do have to pay a bill or it's something where they feel like they can't do anything else. And there's a lot of pressure there, um, you know, and if somebody's not fully invested in it, it makes it difficult. And with kids, it's like they genuinely love it, um, you know, for the most part, obviously. And so I love that. I love finding, you know, somebody who I see the showcase and I think they're really great and they're young and they may need some development, but I see that I see that something in them when I go there and, and helping them and kind of nurturing their career and seeing them succeed. Like there's nothing better than that. So um, that's one of the upsides of working with kids, which I love. And Laura, do you work with all ages? Um, kids as well. We are youth division. Obviously we go, we go up to like young twenties to play high school. Like to play or, younger. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, but kids as well. And same kind of thing. I think it's, really cool in the youth space that we can really find unknown talent and we actually can get them in a really big room and book them on a series regular role and I think that's a lot harder to do with adult clients um so yeah I love finding like a fresh kid that just loves it so much and really walking them through the whole journey all the way from like booking their first co-star their first guest star to their first series um I think that's really like special about doing young kids yeah. One of the things that we say is literally one of the first questions that I ask all the kids and I ask the kid when they come into audition for us in our studios and live and everything um, is, are you being forced to be here? And I'm telling you, a lot of the kids will rat their parents out. They'll be like, no, I don't want to be here. I want to be playing basketball. So talk <laughs> a little bit about how a parent can help their kid in this business as opposed to sort of harm their kid in this business and listen to your kid. If they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Mallory? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think that it's easy for us to see, um, yeah. you know, when we have our meetings with the kids and the parents, every agency is different. And even the way that, you know, I, ha I hold meetings as opposed to how maybe Laura or one of the other girls in LA holds meetings, we're all different. And we all, we all kind of figure out the way that it works best for us. So for me specifically, usually what I do is I meet with both the parents and the kids. Um, you know, for for the way that we work as much as I'd love to be talking to the kids all day about auditions and, you know, and figuring out times and stuff like that. The reality is, is that, you know, we're talking to parents 99% of the time. So I need to have, you know, a positive relationship with the parents for it to really work. And so a big piece of that is kind of also seeing the interaction between the kids and the parents in the meeting and kind of seeing how they vibe together. And I'll ask a question to, the kid and obviously we expect the kid to answer and um to be receptive to it and if I find that a lot of the time the parent is answering for the child or um I feel like they're kind of butting in a lot and putting their two cents in I'll you know I'll sometimes that'll be a little bit of a red flag to me to say okay you know is this something that you're more interested in your child doing rather than your child being more interested in it um you know we need to see that they're passionate about it before we decide to um, to sign you guys because that's what's most important and that's what's going to have them book the job at the end of the day. So that's, um, you know, a little bit of a red flag for us and something that we always look out for. And on the flip side, um, if I have a meeting and the parent's really supportive and, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, she told me she wanted to do this and I'm just here now to be supportive and take them to the auditions and pay for the lessons and all of that. Like, that's what we love to hear is that you know, they're there to support and obviously nurture their kids um, in the industry. And it helps so much for us because a huge piece of, you know, the puzzle, I guess you could say, in all of this is really the parents. So yeah, that's support, really Support, not force. Exactly. What about you, exactly. Laura? Yeah, very similar. Um, we usually do, when we take meetings, we call the 
we have the kid come in first by themselves so that we can ask them that exact same question. We always say like, why do you want to be an actor? Or what made you want to be an actor? And they will always rat their parents out. It's so funny. And they'll either say like, yeah. oh, I don't want to do this. My mom like is making yeah. me do it or whatever. I have no idea why I'm here usually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, like my mom, I, literally we've had kids say before, like if I do, if I go to auditions, my mom gives me McDonald's after like. Yeah. So um, that's the number one thing we're looking for. We really will not sign a kid unless they want to do it. That is just an automatic pass for us if the kid doesn't want to do it um so after we have them come in and we kind of talk to them by themselves without the parent in the room we do also have them do a read and then we do have the parents in and all the stuff Mallory said is just like making sure the parent is going to be supportive making sure the parent can take them to last minute auditions making sure the parent understands what they're signing up for that it is you know a business and they're it is going to require a commitment on their end yeah I'm assuming these are some of your clients. Corbin Pitts says, yay, we love DDO kids. Laura and Mallory are awesome. Just FYI. <laughs> hey, hey guys. Um, so yeah, so let, talk about when it is someone brand new. Number one, how do you find them? If it's in a theater or a showcase, what stands out to you? So let's just go with those two. How do you find them? And then what does stand out when you see a kid? You're like, okay, that's the, that makes me want to bring them into the office. Laura, you want to start? Sure. Um, we find kids all kinds of ways. Um, we definitely go to showcases, acting schools, um, and then also a lot of manager referrals, um, even acting teacher referrals sometimes if an acting teacher refers us, you know, someone. Um, and then we also take email submissions. So you can look at our website and there's email submissions right on our website, specifically how to submit and what to send. And we check those constantly. We can't write back to every single one, but we absolutely look at every single one. Um, so yeah, we, you know, as far as an email submission goes, you really, you need to have a headshot in there and you want to have footage. It doesn't have to be professional footage. It could just be a self tape, but we, if we can watch something of the actor, then that gives us a much better sense on whether we want to take a meeting or not. And really it's, you know, training and confidence. And then obviously we're always looking for specific types that we are in need of um, in our roster at that time. So sometimes we can just tell off a headshot if we're interested in possibly taking a meeting because maybe we're really in need of that type and that age. Um, and then we can kind of go from there. Mallory? Um, yeah, same way as far as like submissions, we're definitely finding people at showcases and workshops and, and online submissions has been a really great way um, to scout talent for sure. Uh, something that I guess we see that really kind of sparks our interest, I think is a huge piece of it is kind of, I always, everybody always talks about like that it factor. And really it's, it's easy to see when, especially when you're meeting a large group of kids, um, you know, that one kid that goes up there and just has that confidence and is prepared. And you just know, you have that feeling that they're going to book those jobs, that they're going to have that ability to um, really do well in the room and impress the casting directors. And so that's something that we're constantly looking for. And I think because the industry is so incredibly competitive nowadays, I mean, more so than it's ever been, I think that we're even pickier about who we decide to meet and sign, especially at a showcase, you know, like I, I was saying the other day is that we'll go to the showcases and I'll mark maybes, you know, yeses, noes, circle back and all of that. And then at the end, kind of narrow that down even a little bit more because it just doesn't make sense to take on such an influx of kids anymore because things are so competitive and because it's so difficult to really get in the room. So we're super specific about, you know, people that we sign and we meet because you need to have that, that X factor in order to really um, do well in the business. I think a lot of times it's the parents forget that when, and you said the if factor, it's the best thing because we don't know what it is until right. we see it. And to, so right. it's not something specific. It's just something that jumps out at you. So I think that that's really great because a lot of parents are like, well, do I, they're only looking for blonde kids right now, but yes, but tomorrow they could be looking for black kids and Asian kids and this and that, but doesn't, you don't know. So um, but you did mention something that I want to ask, just kind of piggyback on not taking on a whole lot of clients anymore, trying to remain competitive. So, because in the agency world, I mean, I've been in this over 21 years now, but 
and as an agent, but I've been in the business. But so, and, and it used to be to have as many clients as you want, as you can throw the spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks kind of thing. And I have noticed in the last like five to seven years that it kind of, that people whittle down their lists now. And what's the reasoning for that? If you think that you could have more clients and kind of put more against the wall, what's the reasoning for being more about a smaller list? I think it depends. I think it also, it's, it's different for LA than it is for New York. And I think each market is probably different. You know, I mean, the, I think the overall idea is that obviously you want to have the best of the best on a list, mm -hmm. but I guess speaking from New York's perspective, you know, for us, in the past few years, um, a lot of like the smaller agencies have shut down. A lot of the management companies have kind of really downsized to a really, really small list of kids. So we're competing against, you know, um, agencies that have really perfected who's working there and who they have on their client list. So in order to remain competitive with those people, we have to be really specific about who we take on. Um, you never want to, you know, cause again, it's our reputation too as an agency when anybody steps in the room. So you wanna make sure that you're putting the best kids forward. So those casting directors call, you know, call you when they have open slots or they're, they wanna bring in one, that, that one extra kid, you know, they're gonna contact you or, um, those five extra commercial appointment times, you want them to, you know, be able to come to you for those things. And in order for that to happen, you need to be able to, um, you know, feel really confident about the kids that you're submitting. And that's why it's so important to really vet everybody and make sure that they're fully prepared and that they're going to the auditions prepared because, you know, they're, they are a reflection on DDL when they go in the room. Yeah. Laura, you second that. We have yeah, some questions. Have... Oh, sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I think it definitely has changed. Um, and I think that another part, especially in the kids specifically world, we as agents in the kids being kids agents, we have to be able to keep up with our clients and know them really well and know how they're growing and changing in order mm -hmm. to continue to submit them correctly. So whereas like an adult client maybe doesn't need to see their agent for, for a few years because they're playing the same age range and they genuinely look, you know, the same. Um, but a kid, absolutely not. Like we have to continually keep up with them and see new footage of them and have them come into the office and they've grown six inches and their hair's short and their hair's long and their bodies change. I mean, it's crazy. So we have to, we have so much more to keep track of, um, even in terms of like work permits and all of that. So it's really hard to have just too many clients because you just won't be able to keep up and you won't be able to then properly pitch the kids for what they really should be going out for. Good. Yeah. Um, one of the questions is when is the best time to follow uh, J Jada Wooten said, when is the best time to follow up on an email? Do you guys like follow up on emails when they submit to you? If they, if do you like a follow up? Um, I, for me personally, um, you don't need to follow, like it should be months in between your following up. If you sent an email submission and you didn't hear back, it means that we unfortunately aren't interested in taking a meeting at that time. Now our roster is constantly changing. So you absolutely can resubmit and send a new submission, but you should wait at least a few months between. Um, and then, you know, something in our roster might've changed, but there's no reason to resubmit like every day. That's not going to do anything. No. Because, yeah. But I, if I can piggyback, if I can say that, let's say they, they book something that's in, in, yes. in a couple of weeks yes. or something, new that might be a good, yeah. yeah. New information yeah. is another great reason. If you have new footage that you didn't have the first time you submitted, new headshots that you didn't have the first time you submitted, any new information that changes the submission, absolutely. Um, what is the next step after you get a call back, let's say from a showcase or something, I guess, but never heard back from the agent? What should you do next? Let it go, email again, what do you think? Um, I think for us, you know, if we're talking about that you had a call back, you met with us, we had a meeting, usually it's important for us to follow up, you know, no matter what. Um, I, as a courtesy, and I think that, you know, probably everybody that works as, you know, a legit agency would have the courtesy to follow up with people that they have invested their time in. Um, because at the end of the day, we're investing our time and energy into meeting you. And I know that you're taking time out of your day also as a parent and the child to come and meet with us and come into the city or, you know, travel to LA and have the meeting with them as well. So it's important that we always follow up. Is it going to be right away? Not always. Sometimes I do meet somebody during a period of time. And I know in that exact moment, 
Um, it's going to be probably a week or two before I make any final decisions only because sometimes when I go to these showcases, I will end up meeting with five, six, seven kids and then deciding from there whether I want to take on all of them or only a certain amount and sometimes comparing and contrasting and figuring out who's going to fit on the list at that time. And like we were just saying, you know, types always change, lists always always change so it's important for us to make sure that it is the right time um but in that case you know if i i've had parents follow up and say hey we're just checking in you know we met with you last week and i will always respond right away and say simply you know um you know i will follow up next week with you i promise i'm just kind of rounding out the list and you know making some final decisions so it's good communication you know that's good yeah yeah absolutely same for you laura yeah, we always fall. If we did meet with you, we will always let you know one way or the other. We won't just leave you like, un Dang. you know, how, yeah. yeah, you'll know, we'll send you an email and say, unfortunately, at this time, we're not offering rep because of X, Y, Z, or yes, we are offering rep, but yeah, you wouldn't not hear from us ever again after a meeting. Yeah. Ileana Conley says, uh, but first, Ileana, her daughter is 15 and she's actually amazing. She's very sick right now. Um, so she's quarantined. So we want to say a little prayer for um, Anamia. But Ili anyway, her mom Hi, is on. And Ileana said, when is a good time to submit for representation if the contract with the current agency expires in May? Very specific. Let's hope her agent is not on here. <laughs> <laughs> not mine. <laughs> no, she's not, they're not here. Yeah. So what would be uh, like if the current one is expiring in a month, what's, you know, should they do, I guess that question is, should they do it now while they have one or should they wait until they're done? Or what do you guys think? So it's actually interesting that this question is brought up because something similar happened literally this past week um, with a client and they were, their contract was up literally, I think three weeks ago um, with another agency. And we had met with them right before all of this happened. And so now obviously now that the contract is up, now they're interested in kind of moving forward and they wanted to know you know, how to kind of part ways slash, was it a good idea to meet with that with me with us then because the contract wasn't officially up and is that proper protocol and how do they go about kind of breaking the news to the agency now? So it's similar um, to what your question was, but, you know, I think that if you're interested in leaving your agency, the first thing you should do without question is have a conversation with your agents before you do anything, before you make any final decisions. And that's a yeah. Yes. And that's a big piece of it because I think a lot of the time people are afraid to say something to an agent or a manager that they are unhappy or they feel like something's not right or the communication's off. And we would much rather 10 times over have that conversation initially, talk it over, figure out where the miscommunication is coming from, and then potentially salvage the relationship if both of both sides want to, rather than be blindsided and have them leave and not understand why and also not understand. Or try to fix it. Yeah. Right. Right. And fix it on their own without communicating with us. And that's right. a big piece of it because, you know, we may say on our end, well, the reason she's not going out is because this isn't updated or, you know, we haven't heard from you in months or we don't really know what's going on. And then working together to make that work and fix that issue sometimes will, you know, allow you to give it another year and see how things go. Yeah. Help me um, help you and see what happens. Yeah. Exactly. If you've done that already and it's, you know, you feel like it's just time to part ways. A lot of the time people do start to look for other agencies, you know, a month or two before their contracts are up because they don't like to have that gap in between um, the other agency and their new one. I think it's preference at the end of the day. Um, you know, we just ask for honesty, obviously, always. And there should never be a situation where you're working with two agencies at once if you've signed with either of them. And so just kind of being transparent um, is what's really important. Laura? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I feel like a lot of people put um you know too much emphasis on the contract and it's and and the dates if if like she said go and talk to your agent if you think you want to leave your agency that's the first step period because either you are going to salvage that relationship or you're going to fix what's missing and it's going to be great or there you guys maybe your agent agrees and i said to people before you know what you're right i don't know why I can't get you out something about you like go ahead and look and you could get the blessing from them to go ahead and look for another agency you know what i mean so that's that's preferable always and it is a small world so you don't want to like mm -hmm. you know i for me it's better to not step on toes and 
and you don't know if you're submitting to an agent that's your agent's best friend. Like we're right. all really close. So that, and so you just don't want to do that unless the agent knows, because I could pick up the phone and go like, Hey, I just got a submission from your client. So-and-so like, what, did you like working with them? Were they good? Is there any red flags I should know about? And then if your agent doesn't know that, you know, you're going to get an angry phone call. So like she said, just transparency, the industry is very small. So word travels very quickly. So just be careful and just be honest with everybody. How about, you know, do you know Dana Fletcher and Matt Fletcher? Yeah. Well, I mean, so they tell me all the time how one yep. will go into coast to coast and then, or, and like want to leave them and go to like KMR or whatever. I'm like, they're yep. married. Yes, they're doing yep. the same age, like agents in different companies, but that is going to be found out. Yeah. <laughs> gotta be I think of that. especially um, with us too, especially in New York, like we, we all go to the same showcases. Yeah. We all do the same workshops. We all know each other. We're all working on the same projects. It's like, we're going to know yep. fairly soon if yeah. you end up going with somebody else and you lied about it or you weren't truthful. So. And when I was a man, I was a manager for 17 years. I established very early on, it's sort of us against them. Like we have to take care of each other. If we start right. kind of fighting amongst each other and yeah, it happens here and there with a client or whatever, but we do have to kind of watch out for each other to not step sure. on each other's toes. Because at the end of the day, we also do move around. Maybe I'll move to your agency and all of a sudden, oh, I screwed you over once. You know, that kind of thing. So right. we do look out for each other. Yeah. Next Absolutely. question is, what are some of the reasons you would let, have to let a client go? Um, I mean, yeah, I think there could be a lot of reasons, but a lot of it is just not following direction, to be honest. If we're asking for something that we really need a tool from you to get you out more and we're not getting that over and over again, it, I mean, that is like the number one reason why we end up parting ways with people is like, we've been asking for new headshots for months and we keep following up. We need new headshots. You don't look like this anymore. We need them. We need them. We need them. And then that's not happening. Then at that point, there's nothing we can do. And, and that's going to be really hard for us to work with. And we have to focus on the people that we do have the right tools for. Um, you know, it's pretty rare that we would drop someone that's totally trying their best and putting it out their full effort. Um, we're not someone that is like, oh, if you don't book with an X amount of time, we're going to drop you. We, we do really believe in the kids that we sign. And sometimes it can take a long time and we're going to be with you on that journey. As long as you're doing everything on your end, then we believe in you and we know it's just a matter of time and the right role for you. But it's a lot of the communication. If you're missing auditions, we can't get a hold of you. You know, we're asking you for certain things or updating your sites or tools and you're not following through. That's the biggest thing for me. Do you, do you, uh, Talia Simone said, do you ever start to get discouraged in your client if they aren't booking big or any work right away no i mean right away to be honest i added right away just because she kind of ended it there and i was like well okay. you know but yeah sorry go ahead um i mean i don't think right away is what we're ever expecting to be honest we are expecting that it's going to be a long haul and that it's going to be a marathon and we're in it with you so that we're never discouraged if you're not booking right away at all i mean and it's more about like callbacks. If you, mm -hmm. you know, if it's been a long time and you haven't gotten a single callback, then we might be more like concerned. Like, okay, we need to, where have you been training? What classes have you been in? Because, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but booking is so specific and it really takes a long time for some people and that's okay. Um, so we don't really put a time limit on it. Yeah. You agree, Mallory? Yeah, absolutely. We also know we work, we're working with kids. So at the end of the day, most of the time we're taking on kids who are developmental or are starting out in the industry and we see something really special in them. And we know that, you know, they're, our hope is obviously that they're going to start booking jobs. Um, a lot of the time parents will ask us for feedback or they'll say, you know, what, how do we know we're doing well? How do we know that you're going to renew our contracts? You know, she hasn't booked a job yet or whatever. And like, I always say our feedback is a callback. So our, unless we can get something specific, our feedback is knowing that you're doing the right thing because the casting directors are calling you in again. Um, and the same thing goes for if they're working on multiple projects and they do call in the same kid over and over. Mm -hmm. That's also our way of knowing that they're doing well in the room and, you know, something positive is coming from it. Yeah. Let's see. Sorry. Now they're coming in like crazy. Do you need to live in Los, uh, Kristen Shield says, do you need to live in Los Angeles or New York? 
assuming if you're in another city, how do you guys operate with that? Mallory, you want to no. start? Uh, yeah, no, you don't have to live in LA or New York. We actually, um, we do something pretty cool with DDO that I don't think a lot of agencies do. And what it is, is that we take our clients from out of each state. So if they don't live specifically in New York, Chicago, or LA, what we'll do is we'll take those clients. I have clients who live in Oklahoma and, you know, Laura's clients from Arizona and all of that. And we'll, uh, not all of them, but we will take a select few of those clients and we will all send them out. And so basically they're represented on all in all three cities um, because they're not necessarily based anywhere specific. So it's possible for them to audition for projects that are in New York, LA and Chicago um, without physically being there. And then the only thing we ask for is that you, uh, that the parents understand that they have to be willing to travel for second rounds and callbacks and producer sessions and all of that. And sometimes that is investing a little bit of money and time into the process, but um, it helps and it is a way to kind of get your, get to the next level. Um, so that's a conversation that we have with everybody from the beginning, but we do like to try to take those clients who are not necessarily based anywhere specific and service them um, in all three cities, because why not? You know, if you're based in Arizona, then why not have the opportunity to audition for New York projects and Chicago projects and LA projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Laura, what about you? How, uh, let's talk about maybe what jumps out at you if, uh, for a self-tape. So like you have these clients all over and, and, they send the self tape to you. What jumps out at you, or what the, can they do at home to really make their self tape pop? Um, I mean, really, you know, some of the simple things like don't record it in the middle of your bedroom with your kitchen in the background, with people <laughs> walking by, with noises. Their dog, yeah. Try to really have it at least against a blank wall. Make sure there's a reader on the other side of the camera that's reading with you. Try to have good lighting. Um, and then it's really, you know, just that confidence you prepared, you're memorized, you made a choice. I think that people make the mistake most commonly, especially with self tapes, but really all auditions is that they just do what's on the page. Mm -hmm. And that is like the bare, bare minimum. Everyone is going to do what's on the page. Everyone can do what's on the page. It's like, everyone has the same lines as you. So you have to bring something else to the table that is not the lines. So it's the reactions. It's the moments between the lines when you're not talking. I find that like the best moments in scenes and self tapes are not when you have your line, it's when you don't have your line. Um, and those are the really special moments that I see that make kids stand out is when I see kids do that kind of thing, I know that they're at the next level. Yeah. You don't suggest though, like, I mean, I know Amazon, you can get I think a lighting kit for like 80 bucks and stuff, but do you suggest going like, full on with it or doing with doing what you can with what you have? I think it depends. I mean, obviously I think the tape looks better if you do have a lighting kit and definitely a tripod, you need to have like the camera, even if it's on your iPhone, you need to have it like steady. It's really distracting if it's like someone's holding it by hand. Um, but you kind of do what you can. I think at the end of the day, the best actor is gonna book the role. They're not gonna ever say, well, this actor didn't have a lighting kit, so he's not getting it. I mean, that's right. just not gonna happen. Yeah. Uh, but of course you can't be in the pitch black either. Yeah. All right, let's see. Any, are actors who are represented able to submit to other work themselves? That's from Corey. Um, yeah, so I think, again, it depends on uh, its preference um, per agent and manager. Sometimes people, certain agents and managers don't like when their clients submit themselves on anything and they like to kind of handle everything themselves and um, kind of be the liaison between um, casting directors and the clients. Me personally, because we have access to so much uh, like student, so many student films and independent films, a lot of that pops up often in New York um, that don't really pay much, if anything. I do allow clients to submit themselves on those types of projects just to build their resumes and also to eventually have things to put on a reel in order to pitch them for projects. So smaller things like that, you know, usually I'll, ha I'll ask them first to check with me to make sure that we're not working on it. And then if we're not, and it's something that they're interested in, and I know that it's legit and it's not something that, you know, they're going to be in a situation where they don't feel comfortable, then I'll allow them to submit themselves on the project and work on it. 
And hopefully we do get something positive from it, like some material for a reel or an extra credit on the resume or something like that. But it really is all case by case. And many times it's a discussion beforehand with us um, to make sure that everything looks copacetic and they can submit it on themselves. Yeah, I, would, I want to just piggyback on that and to say, you know, at the end of the day, your agent is not just there to just get you auditions. Like if you get something on your own, even if it is paid, let your agent negotiate it because they can get yep. you better things. They can help you. They're in your corner to do that as well. So you guys agree, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. A lot of times I think that they, they just, they, there's a misnomer of that. Well, they, they get us auditions. And if we get this on our own, no, 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 no. They're there to protect you. They're there to help you to, you know, you don't want to show up to set and you have the crappiest dressing room because guess what? You didn't let your agent help you. Right. So um, right. any advice for actors? This is, for, uh, I can't read that. Uh, any advice for actors who are low income and their parents can't really afford to do all the classes and things like that? What can they do at home, maybe, or on their yeah, own? I think there's like, there are some resources that are, you know, I mean, right now you're in the prime for yeah. that um, because everyone yes. is doing free virtual classes, oh, virtual open calls, Instagram lives, Facebook lives, casting directors every day are doing lives, answering questions. And there's people that are even doing like audition feedback for free. So the, this is your prime time for that. There's so many free resources out there. Um, but even, you know, separately from quarantine, there's so many books that are like, you could get from the library that are- Harry you know, Greenspan's so book, Auditionology is fabulous yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. There's yeah. so many resources. And then there are some, app, there's a free app called SceneBot. That's a great resource where you can record scenes and um, have access to a bunch of sides and scenes and you can submit for feedback. So you just have to kind of do your research. There is free and low cost um, tools that you can also use. Yeah. What about doing the stuff, stuff themselves as far as like YouTube channels and working on their social media and things like that? Like what, that it, one, talk about how important it is and two, what they, what they should be putting out into the world and what they should not be, essentially. Mallory? Uh, yeah, so creating your own content has been something that we've talked about a lot in the past, I would say probably the past year. That, Mallory, um, what happened to you? And we're like looking at I'm, your- Are you, am I bad? I had to be sideways, I had to plug my phone in. Oh, okay, I, we could see your <laughs> cord. I was like, what? I'm like looking at your hey, keyboard. Mallory, no, it's right, fine, right. it's fine. I just okay, didn't know all of a sudden, it looked like she was like, <laughs> like creeping <laughs> over the keyboard. All right, sorry, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. YouTube, social media. I like had to figure account. out a way to plug it in so it didn't die. Yeah. Um, sorry. So yeah, so um, yeah, creating content has been something that's been really important, especially in like meetings where parents will ask us, you know, what do we do to get our kids out there? Should we be creating Instagrams for them? Should we be, um, you know, working on, on YouTube series? And if so, what should they look like? Should we keep stuff up from when she was three years old at her dance recital? Is that going to be positive for her for auditions? The answer is no. Stuff like that's really not going to help them. Um, so you have to be really creative about the way that you post content and the things that you post in general. Having an Instagram, yes, I think it's a great idea. We keep calling it a necessary evil because a lot of parents hate it mm -hmm. um, and they hate putting their kids out there in that way. So that's why it's always important to be really safe about it. And obviously the parents should um, always monitor the accounts, if not fully run and them. on there, managed by mom and then your yes. account. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a big piece of it too. That's like the first thing that, you know, I say in a meeting is make sure that you're monitor monitoring the accounts. And if the kids want to have a personal account where they post with their friends and they, you know, do silly videos and things like that, they can absolutely do that, but just keep it private and then have a, you know, have a public professional account where you can post that material. You know, everybody's doing the TikTok videos now. Everybody's doing like the YouTube, like cooking how-to videos and things like that. And I think that's great, you know, in this downtime, especially when there's really nothing going on, why not be creative and kind of create your own content um, within reason? You never want to put anything up there that you wouldn't be proud to uh, put forward to a casting director or an agent or a manager. Yeah. You agree, Laura? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, create your own content, whatever that means to you. You know, if you're an artist, you're an artist. You should be, you know, creating content do scenes with your friends, you know, all that kind of stuff absolutely is going to help. Um, I think don't necessarily focus on like gaining a following because all the casting directors we've talked to 
have said that that is not a factor and that's, it's not a good um, use of your time or your energy. You're much better off becoming a better actor than you are trying to get a following and then thinking that you're going to book a role from a following. The people that book are the best actors and if they happen to have a following they happen to have a following but it's usually never ever because of that so i just recently sent out to all of our um parents and i said look i don't care if they're four and i said manage it for them but create it now it'll make sense be on brand think about disney nickelodeon some of these like back to school ads that you just want you know you don't want crazy stuff out there or whatever number one number two though i did say to them look it, talent comes first and casting is never going to look at your Instagram before they pull you in for an audition. No, they're going to pull in who they think is right for the role. But if it happens to come down to, and networks have done this, if it happens to come down to two actors and they're really split decisions, but they look and one has 20,000 followers on Instagram and the other one only has two followers. Yes, that may edge them out, but that's never going to be the reason that, oh, well, they're not as great of an actor. Let's just go with them because they have 20,000 followers. No, sure. you know, do you guys agree? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Teddy Flynn, hi Teddy, said, how often should you get new headshots? And he's a teenager. Mm. Um, well, I think it depends on your age, first of all. Um, when you're younger, I would say like three to seven, you probably change every single day you wake up. You know, kids are constantly growing and their faces are changing and their heights are changing and their look is changing, their hair color changes they're constantly, constantly evolving. So when you're that young, it is super important to keep up with your headshots. Um, if not every six months, getting updated photos, um, you should probably consider taking some of your own every few weeks, just so we can see what the child looks like for our personal files. Because I've had kids that I've met at a showcase that were five or six years old, and then it's been six, seven months, and they go into an audition, and the casting director calls me and said, just so you know, she can't play six anymore. Like, she mm -hmm. has grown, and that's not, and, you know, for us, we want to know that stuff before a casting director has to tell us that. And the only way that we can know that is for your parents to update us with sizes and photos. So if you're really not updating them every six months and that's in that younger, you know, age group and we understand it's expensive and it, it you know, it's, it's not cheap to get professional headshots. So if you can take some nice ones on your own, for us personally, it's okay um, when they're that young. But once you hit the teens, once a year is what we suggest and we do suggest professional ones. If I could piggyback on that as well, parents, if you... If you get sent an audition, if one of these lovely ladies is your agent, they send you an audition and, and it's for a six-year-old and clearly Susie does not look six anymore, transparency, let's go Flag back it. to that. Just right. call them and say, well, I don't know, she's like four foot one now, like, or something, you know what I mean? Be honest, because like you said, you don't want to hear it from somebody else. You'd rather hear it from your client. We were just working on an open call for a casting agency and there was roles for high school kids and there was roles for middle school kids and the ages kind of overlapped by like a year. And so I sent some to kids for middle school and then I had a few parents reach out to me and say, hey, you know, she grew a few inches. She really kind of does fit more in that high school category. Is it okay if we, ta we take the high school material instead? And I'm like, absolutely. And thank you for telling me and please update your, you know, your casting sites with that yeah. information because this is a great time for us to learn that information too when we have this downtime and a great time for everybody to start updating their stuff so we have it ready to go when we need it. Yeah, smart. Do you have any advice for a 12-year-old girl? Giovanna said, do you have any advice for a 12-year-old girl in the music business? I mean, I'll just disclaimer, they're television, film, commercials, but what about music and singing leading into television, film, and commercials or theater? I don't know too much about that. Yeah, I mean, I we don't work in the music business specifically. I don't really like. I'm not an expert in that field. I don't know how to get someone started in the music industry. Um, obviously, if you are an actor and you sing, that is only going to help you. Then we can get you in for roles that require singing. I think voice lessons are great for anyone that's an actor. It's only going to expand your skills. Um, there's obviously a lot of like musical based shows these days. So if you can at least carry a tune, that's going to open you up to a lot more auditions. Um, even playing an instrument, any special skills really set you apart um, as far as on camera acting goes. Um, 
but yeah, as far as like specifically the music industry, that's a whole nother ball. Yeah. Ball. Whole yeah. Other beast. This is a great question. Have you guys touched on the fact, uh, uh, Maria said, how, have you guys touched on how you think the industry will start back up once everyone go, gets the go ahead? We're scheduled to go to LA in September one until Christmas. Will they finish up pilot season or go right into episodic? Your thoughts? That's a deep question for right now. <laughs> so, I, I think it's a difference between what we think and what we are hoping for. Yeah. <laughs> or what we are wishing is gonna happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I, I don't know. I mean, and that's the, the, the little bit of the scary part about it is that we don't know. Yeah. Um, I think that what we hope is that once everybody gets to go ahead to be together in places where you can film and um, have larger gatherings for sets and uh, shoots and things like that. Then we hope it all just kind of circles back and kind of we go back to normal. Um, if anybody's noticed, the majority of the things that people are doing while in quarantine is watching TV and movies and enjoying yeah, entertainment and watching yeah. success. We, you know, this is what people need. This is what yeah. people brings people up and uplift, uplifts them and helps them connect. And so I think that we have no choice but to get back to normal because this is what people are craving at this point. So whatever that looks like, I don't, we don't know yet yeah. um, or how that's going to look. We don't know yet, but I think our hope is that we do get back to, you know, what we were and potentially even stronger and better. But who's to say right now, we, we can't really predict the future. Very unsure. I read something the other day that they, that, you know, sometimes they do background checks, depending on what the size of the film or network, or whatever it is, that they would test for COVID-19 as well now going forward. Do you hmm. guys think that's a possibility, Laura? Yeah, I mean, it's possible that this is going to go, I mean, even if we have the go ahead, I mean, I think the self tapes are going to last a lot longer than we might even think because you know, it's not going to just go back to normal day one. It's going to be a very slow transition. So there might be like five people allowed to be in a room and then 10 people allowed to, you know, so I don't think they're going to be able to have as many in-person auditions for a while, maybe longer than we think. So the self-taping is something that you just have to master because mm -hmm. it's going to go on and on. Um, and I know even now they are starting to book and they have booked some of our clients on commercials where they got booked right now off of a self-tape audition and then they filmed it. In they their filmed house. their portion from home in their yeah. living room, sent it in, and then they edited that with something else. So yep. that might be, you know, I think getting technology savvy is very important right now because I yeah. do think that, you know, and we are seeing some of the late night shows there. That's what they're also doing. They're filming stuff at home and they're editing it together. So the more, you know, tech, the, the more tech you are and, and savvy you are with all that, I think is going to come into play big time. The people that know how to edit can shoot from home. I think that's going to put them in a different playing field and they're going to be able to come back sooner than, than others. Yeah. We just had Michael Sanford. I was me and Michael Sanford do it on Monday night. And he had just literally talked about how he's going to do a commercial and they're going to do it from home and they're going to edit together. Yeah. I mean, look, it's the wave, the new wave. Ileana says, what extra skills are most appealing to you when you decide to sign talent? Special skills, extra kind of things that they can do. Mallory? Um, speaking other languages is speaking a other huge languages. plus for us being bilingual, trilingual, whatever you can possibly put on that resume and, you know, actually support because a lot of people put that they can speak seven other languages and then I, we ask them and they're like, well, right. I can, And then it's know, no habla español, it. no. That's right, okay. exactly. Right. So that's, you know, that's not gonna work. But um, I will say that if you can go into a room and have a conversation in another language, that is a huge, huge plus. And I think dance skills have become a really big plus for us, especially people who are really knowledgeable, like in the hip hop world. Um, a lot of commercials have asked for that recently that have, you know, they can like break dance and pop and lock and all of that, which don't even, I mean, I don't even know where to begin with that, but if you can do it, fantastic. Um, and then sports skills. We have people who, you know, who can dribble a ball, who can dunk, a hoop in a hoop and I sound personally talking about sports I have no idea again when I'm talking about but <laughs> from what um they're asking they want people who have those 
skills for specific commercials like Nike or Adidas or, you know, things in the um, sports apparel world. So those are all big, um, big pieces of special skills that we look for. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Are you being, uh, are, is being homeschooled and passing the Chesapeake advantages for a 15 year old when submitting for representation? Um, the Chesby, absolutely huge, huge, huge. It's really um, a game changer for us. If you have passed the Chesby in LA, at least it's a, it's night and day. And the, the Chesapeake guys, just so you know, is it's a te you take a test. You either have to be a, a sophomore or 16 and it emancipates you. doesn't mean you don't have to listen to your mom and your daddy anymore. It just means that you can work as a legal 18. Sorry, go ahead, Laura. Yes. Um, and it's legal emancipation is different than Chespy. Chespy means that you don't need a set teacher anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but you still, you know, your parents still have to sign a contract for you. If you become emancipated, like through a court, that's different. It's a little bit more intense where you're actually in charge of your own finances. You can sign your contracts on your behalf. You're like actually separating yourself from your parents. Um, but if you take that test and you pass it, then you are what's called legal 18, like he said, and then you don't need a set teacher. And then basically you are still a minor. So you still work minor hours, but instead of schooling those hours that they would normally school you, you can now film those hours. Mm -hmm. So you do kind of get extra hours. Um, and so you're much more appealing to hire to a studio and a network if you are legal 18. And a lot of the roles for us, it says it right on the breakdown. It'll say, must be legal 18 to play 15, must be legal 18 yeah. to 14. So a lot of a lot of these roles, we can't even submit kids who aren't legal 18, unfortunately, yeah. um, it's become such a thing. So if you're in that range, 15, 16, absolutely take it as soon as you possibly can. When I repped, most when I repped actors, but when I repped Tyler Blackburn, I'm pretty little liars. Nobody could believe that he was 23, 24 when he first started that show. And all of them were. I mean, remember, I don't know how old you guys, I'm probably older than you, but even the original 90210, they were all in their 20s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know oh, what I mean? Oh, yeah, I can see that. Does, I can totally see it. Yeah, but it does help with the the hours, like you said, and it's, it's a benefit to production. Yep. So that's your lo that's the question for you, Ileana. We only have a few more questions, and then we'll wrap it up, guys. Um, do you have any tips on facial reactions? Like you were talking about reactions earlier, making sure that you're doing the reaction part. Um, do you have any tips on it as far as what they could be doing so that it's not, I guess, not dead air? That's probably the number one uh, piece of advice that I give when I give feedback for tapes is really work on, and this is something that I always say, the scene doesn't end when you stop speaking. The scene continues, even when you're not talking, even when the other person's speaking on the opposite side of the camera, the scene is still commencing. It's still going on. There's still things happening. And we need to see that you're still in it uh, even when you're not physically talking. And if you watch any television show and there's two people having a conversation, the other person just doesn't go blank mm -hmm. when the person opposite them is talking to them. So that's probably the number one thing that I write when I give feedback for tapes is please work on your reactions. The scene is not going to end when you stop speaking. So that is honestly a pretty common thing, especially for kids. I think that they are more concerned about the next line the and they're more line, concerned yeah. about what they're going to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, it, and then you could see that on their face, which is all the more reason to be prepared and be as memorized as possible. So you don't have to be internally worrying about that. And then that mm -hmm. comes across, you know, when you are taping. So that's something that it's just a memorization thing and it's being present in the scene yeah. instead of thinking about, you know, what's happening next. Yeah. Any tips like that, as far as, with the memorization, what helps with confidence, things like that, Laura, um, as far as exuding that as far as, and in addition to the reactions? Um, yeah, I think everything Mallory said, it really comes down to listening and being in the moment. If you're listening, your face isn't gonna look blank. Like look at all of us right now, cause you guys are listening to me and you're like in it, your eyes are in it. You're like nodding your head. No one's just like blank zoned out or trying yeah. to remember their next line. And you can tell the difference so easily so if when they're doing that self-tape 
if they're really listening to the other person doing the other lines and they're just really in that conversation, it is all over their face. They don't have to try to put on an expression because they're just listening like how you were in a real conversation, you're listening. So you naturally have those reactions. Um, so I think that's just big for kids to learn how to do that. Cause exactly what Mallory said, like a lot of times they're just thinking about their next line and that's a big mistake. And, and that's tough. It takes kids longer to learn and comprehend that they really just need to talk when like how they always talk in real life. Um, when they're really listening to someone speak. Um, and then as far as like confidence, I think people, you know, are a lot of times too concerned about what they think the role is supposed to be and what they think the role is on the page and they don't take chances. And I think it's better to take a chance. It's better to make big choices because again, they're going to watch 20, you know, million of the same tapes. They're watching so many of the same tapes of the same lines. So if everyone just reads the lines the same, that you know that's not what books it's like they would rather see someone make a choice and make try something different and even if that isn't the right you know choice i feel like you at least stand out and then they can they can direct you and they can send you notes and say you know what he was he really stood out to me that's not what we're going for but wow like he stood out let's give him some notes and have him retape you know i think that people don't make choices big choices as much as i wish they would yeah, I agree. So last, I mean, we're almost done. So I would say any last minute words of advice, any like little things that we can bestow on parents. And that's a lot of the parents on Facebook. Uh, what we've realized, and you probably know this now too, is Instagram is a lot more of the kids and Facebook is a lot more of the parents. Um, but I would say, you know, any, any last little tidbits for the parents um, or kids just starting out or ones that are in it as well, but are right now it's dead for everybody. So any last minute words? Uh, I think my number one thing at this point is don't be discouraged, you know, by what's happening right now and really just stay present and stay on track to uh, exactly where you want to go or where your child wants to go. And just be as proactive as possible and try to just engage in, in these things. This is, like, this is a great way to continue to be engaged and have questions answered that you're wondering about or go to a free, you know, seminar that a casting director is doing on Zoom or take a class with um, one of the studios that's offering them online and just continue to stay on track because eventually we will get back to whatever our new normal is going to be and that is somehow going to involve your child still being an actress and still actor or actress and still doing what they love somehow so whatever that may be at this point I think just continue to stay positive about it and you know just try to do as much as you can um, with the resources that um, are being given to you. To piggyback and then I'll throw it to you Laura but to piggyback on that guys everybody who's listening or everybody who watches this I also give everyone, all of us time when it comes back because everybody's going to be trying to figure it out. Everybody's going to be trying to, I don't know who that was, Mallory, but tell them hi. Um, right. Everybody's <laughs> going to be trying to figure out what is the new normal, like she said. So give everybody, have patience too when we all do get back to work. Laura, any last minute words? Yeah, I think everything I agree with both of you guys and you have to really just enjoy the process. I think in general as an actor, you know, one of the, biggest thing that I love to say that I've, I heard from somebody, I don't even remember who originally I heard say it, but an actor's job is to audition. 95% of an actor's job is auditioning. That 5% is actually being on set. The 5%. So if you don't enjoy auditioning, if you're just in this because you want to book, that's really unrealistic because your entire full-time job as an actor is going to be auditioning. Um, and getting turned down and getting those no's and training. That's your job. That's your full-time job. Your time on set is basically like your two weeks of vacation per year. So that's what you kind of have to think about. And that's what you, if you enjoy the auditioning process and you think about that being your job and that being the part you enjoy, then your bookings will come a lot more often. Um, and, and that's the reality of it. So, you know, you really have to find the joy in the, in the whole process. You can't just be waiting for a booking. It can't be robotic either. Like, I, I gotta go to an audition now. No, have some fun with it, you know? Yeah. I think yeah, that absolutely. when I when I'm casting them, when I've seen the kids that have the most fun with it and it exudes from them, 
yep. especially in a director session, because a lot of times my director would be like, have conversations with them and, and see what their personality is, not just about the lines. And the worst thing that would always happen is, well, what do you, what do you like to do? I like to act. No, there's got to be something else that you like to do. <laughs> so bring those things in with you guys in your toolbox, the playing ball in the front or drawing, coloring, cheerleading, whatever it is, be a fully rounded, rounded kid as well. And something we always say in meetings is like something we, and going back to what we look for in a meeting with a kid is that, you know, we want to know that you're going to go in to an audition. You're going to do your best. You're going to prepare. You're going to be, in, you know, into it and, and really invested. And then you're going to walk out of the door and you're going to say, Straight what's for dinner? Yep. And let it go because otherwise you'll go crazy. And there's so much, unfortunately, so much rejection in this industry that we need the kids to be well-rounded because, you know, if this is your number one focus 24 seven, it's not a healthy relationship with the industry. So we want you to have other hobbies and we want you to be able to have other things that you feel passionate about. Um, so then when it comes to the, you know, when it comes to referring back to auditioning and prepping and things like that, you still feel that passion and you still love it. And it's not a resent, you know, you don't resent it because you haven't booked a job or whatever it is. You're like, oh, I have to go to it. Yeah. Right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, ladies, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you guys you. are awesome. Thank you for having us. Thanks yeah, for having so us. much knowledge. I love it. Thank you, Mallory. Thank you, Laura. DDO artist. Thank Mwah. you. Bye, Thanks, guys. Joe. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.